An article that I was recently reading had the purpose of convincing its reader, in that case myself, that I needed to be having a heart for God. And on any other day, I may have passed over that without giving it further thought. But on this particular day, it kind of caught my attention and realized how unique that expression is. I've thought, I give my heart to God, I change my heart for God, but this is saying I am to have a heart for Him. So I began to think about that a little more and for personal growth, personal relationship with God, and so all of that thinking resulted in sharing this material with you this morning. An initial question has to do with self-evaluation. Um, don't I already have that? Don't I already have a heart for God? I go to church. I participate in worship. I read my Bible. I go to God in prayer often. Don't I already have a heart for God? Well, that's a, a self-evaluating question. But I soon realized, maybe, maybe not. Because, just because I go to church, just because I read my Bible, just because I pray, doesn't mean I have a heart for God, at least like he wants me to have. So that caused me to realize that this takes further question. How do I have that? And furthermore, what is that? I thought, well, I have a heart for my wife. I have a heart for my children. I have a heart for my grandchildren, and all, all of us do. Uh, there are lots of things we have a heart for. But a heart for God. How do I know whether I have that or not? And in fact, further, how can I grow in having that? So I went searching, scanning the Bible for passages of Scripture that would help us understand what having a heart for God really is and how we can know whether we have a heart for God or not. And furthermore, what it is that we can do specifically that will allow us to grow in that. So this lesson is really for everyone, for those of us who have been Christians for a long time or even for young people. I would encourage young people to listen carefully because even young people need to have a heart for God at your age. It'll grow, but you need to have it right now. You need to be learning what a heart for God is. And so I invite you to think with me for a few minutes this morning and to consider some passages of Scripture that my scanning the Bible to find passages. That article did not go into the detail I wanted. <laughs> I want to know more because it didn't tell me exactly how I do that but we're gonna share that information this morning from further study. In Acts 13, 22, the Apostle Paul is preaching his first recorded sermon. Not the first time he preached, it's the first time one of his sermons is recorded in scripture. It's in the city of Antioch. And when he got to this point in verse 22, when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king to whom also he bare witness and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who shall do all my will. I would suggest that if any of us thought of any passage in the Bible that had to do with God's heart and our heart, it may have been first thought here. It was mine. To think about what Paul is saying about God and his attitude toward David's heart. This is a memorable passage because this is when David was a young man, an older teenager, before he was 
anointed as king of Israel before Samuel. This is the explanation in 1 Samuel why God chose him, because he had a heart that God liked. And we would suggest that for you and I to identify the kind of heart that we are to have, if we are to have a heart for God, it's got to be a good way to refer to it, a David-like, one like David had. And from what Paul stated in Acts 13, verse 22, from God's own statement that it was a heart that resembled his heart. He found David a man after his heart. God had heart. David had a heart after his heart. David had a heart for God. And we learn from the latter part of this verse that just in a brief statement, who shall do all my will? Now remember, the first part of this verse is referring to Saul who had been appointed the first king of Israel. Uh, he was obedient to a point. He was disobedient a lot toward the end. So God removed him. So this reference is when God had removed him, that is Saul, King Saul. He raised up David. So David was the second king of the United Kingdom of Israel. But Saul wasn't an individual that had the heart that he should have had. It certainly wasn't a heart that obeyed God. And what David had and what God recognized about David, David was one that was obedient in doing all of God's will. But then there are so many things about the life of David as we read and study in the Old Testament. But one of the things that stands out about his heart, he had a sensitivity that everybody needs a sensitivity about their relationship to God, a conscience that bothers you, a conscience that approves you according to God's will. David had that. He had a sensitivity about keeping his heart for God. He said in Psalm 119, this is verse, verses 105 and 106. He said, thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will confirm it that I will keep thy righteous ordinances. I, will, I have sworn before God that I will keep obeying his word. Even after he had sinned later in his life with Bathsheba, and Nathan the prophet went to him and convicted him of that sin, David repented. So he had that sensitivity that allowed him to have a heart that was for God. And you and I, as we go through life from youth to the very end, wherever that, whenever that end may come. We need to have a heart that is like David's heart, a heart that is for God. Well, as we scan the Bible, come to another passage. This way we're going almost to the end of the New Testament. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God, and such we are. That verse has an exclamatory feeling about the great love of God that he had for you and for me to call us children. And John says, that's what we are. We are children of God. With that affirmative statement, we know that. That's affirmed in other passages. But does this not tell us the kind of heart that we are to have for God? The heart of a child. Said, but I'm, I'm in old age, I'm in the golden year. You're still a child of God. <laughs> you will always be a child of God. So from the beginning to the end of life, to have a heart for God means we'll have a heart of a child for a father in that special child-father relationship. Because this is a heart that recognizes and acknowledges the fatherhood of God. There are some people who don't do that. There are some people who may think of God, who acknowledge the Bible as God's word, but do not have that recognition and 
acknowledgement in daily life of God's fatherhood. He is my father in every way in my relationship to him. I am a child to a father in my relationship with God. It causes us to think of what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. The Holy Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's another one of those affirmative statements that is made about us being children of God. But here's what he said in verse 15. Romans chapter 8. You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. That's a familiar statement to most Bible readers. We know that this occurs here and in a few other places. But what it does is represents a heart for God. And that word Abba, you may remember, if you've heard the explanation for it before, it's from the Aramaic language. Not the original New Testament Greek, but from the Aramaic. And it was one of the first sounds that an infant made in recognition of his father, Abba, Abba. And so it became to represent an expression for a father that had strong love and affection, a recognition. And so Paul uses that expression here for our relationship. To have a heart for God means we've got a heart that will say, Abba, Father. We don't have to literally say that, of course, but it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> it just simply means I recognize, even when using this word out of another language, that it represents my heart for God in my recognition of him as my father. I love him. I have feelings of affection for him, and I'm glad to say, Abba, Father. So to have a heart for God, we would suggest the Bible teaches us not only to have a David-like heart, a heart like David that's willing to do everything that God said to do, David was going to do it. But it also means to have a heart of a child for a father. That's a daily basis, every single day. I'm a child. He is my father. He loves me. He has a fatherhood over me. He provides for me. He takes care of me. And this is all, all in and through his son and our Lord and Savior, of course, Jesus Christ. Well, we're still scanning the Bible. We'll go back to the book of Romans here for just a minute. <clears throat> and Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verse 22, Now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto sanctification and the end, eternal life. That's also a familiar passage in Romans chapter 6. It's talking about when people become Christians, when sinners are converted to Christ, what happens? We're made free from sin by being washed by the blood of Christ and cleansed from sin. But he also says we become servants Notice that wording, servants to God. Servants to God. I know that's a matter of semantics, but that is a clear affirmation of this kind of heart. The heart of a servant. The heart of a servant to a master. The heart of a servant for a master. See, that's a little different, isn't it? So we begin to see how the Bible enlightens us and teaches us about the kind of heart that we are to have for God. It has a lot of different facets. And I would suggest to us that we be concerned about as many of them as humanly possible for us because each and every one of them is important to our relationship to him. This is a heart, of course, in our American society, we uh, don't know what it means to be 
we do from study, from hearing about others, but to be a servant, to, and this word is actually the word for slave. So this is actually talking about a heart for God that is a heart that is in total, total, 100% submission to God. Because that's what it means to be a servant. A heart that acts faithfully in doing God's bidding, whatever God wants done. Is this reminiscent of David-like? Yes. And this comes out in this Romans chapter 6, verse 22 passage. But it's also a heart that lives so as to never violate God. We can become so careless and so indifferent about our way of life that we don't even think about whether what we're doing violates God or not. If we would ever realize the seriousness of what it means to violate God, we would never, never do that easily. And I have in parentheses sin, this is what this is talking about. Of course we're going to sin, but this is suggesting a heart for God is having a heart of a servant that will live so as to never displease him, to live so that to all within my power I will avoid sin, committing sin to the best of my ability. I will never intentionally, willfully commit sin. And when it happens, as it will, I will seek forgiveness and I will maintain because violation of God hurts me. My heart for God is hurt when I realize that I have violated him. In Romans chapter 6 in that passage in verse 16, he said, do you not know that when you present yourselves as someone as slaves for obedience, that's the language. You are slaves of the one you obey. And he goes even further and explains that a little bit, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. So the point here is we're servants of somebody. <laughs> we're servants of something, someone. He said, not me. Oh, yes, you are. You're a servant of someone. <laughs> and that's Paul's point. It's so comprehensive that no one is without being a servitude and having servitude to someone or something. And basically, broadly speaking, it's either to Satan or it's to God. If it's to Satan, it's what Paul is talking about here, either of sin and that results in death, or if it's to God, it is of obedience to God that results in righteousness. One or the other. There's no gray area. There's no in-between. Again, a heart for God. Live so as to make sure that as we understand the principles of servitude, slavery is the term, do loss, that we can maintain that relationship by having the right heart for God. And that's a heart of a servant. In addition to being the heart of a child, it's getting a little, a little involved here. So we have to think about these things separately, although they're interrelated, of course. But we think about them separately and we'll grow in them separately. To grow as a child, to grow as a servant are two different ways of growing, although they're interrelated. Let's scan the Bible again. This time we're going to turn to something that Jesus taught. He taught us how to have a heart for God. And several passages may come to mind and several may be applicable, but this is one that we want to read. Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 37 and reading verse 38. He said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the great and first commandment. Let's put that in its setting for just a moment. You may remember that this lawyer came to Jesus after they had put to silence the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees thought they were gonna have a go at it. <clears throat> so this lawyer came to Jesus as 
the American standard says trying him, trying to test him, to entrap him, to catch him. And so he thought the best way to do that is to put it in disfavor with many of the Jews because what they argued about and all of the commandments that they had, which one commentator that I read numbered them in the 800 and some that they argued about. <laughs> which one of these is the greatest? Well, we think this one is. No, we think this one is. Well, so hey, this lawyer came to Jesus and said, oh, I'm gonna get him to commit, and that way he's gonna have the disfavor of a big bunch of Jews. But Jesus answered him in such a way and that's what this verse says. The greatest commandment of all, the very first commandment of all, is that you're to love God with all of your heart. So how can we miss the point of having a heart for God? It's got to be a heart full of love for him. I suggest, that's what I meant at the beginning, I realized when I was trying to answer this question myself, I could go to church, I could sit in the pew, I could read my Bible, I could pray, and not have a heart full of love for God. So we need to look at what it really means to have a heart for God. A heart full of love for God is suggested by the Lord. This is his point of teaching in this passage. And when he uses these three words, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, what he's teaching is with your total being. And really, in other passages, the heart may represent some of those. But I have referenced Mark chapter 12, verse 30, because you may remember that Mark adds a fourth in that gospel record, he mentioned the uh, heart, soul, and mind, and then he said, as number four, with all thy strength. It's just emphasizing the same point. So what the Lord is teaching, God loved us wholeheartedly. God so loved the world that so is a superlative beyond anything that we can imagine was his love for you. All he's wanting is for you to love him. But when we understand having a heart for him, it involves more than just having a half-hearted love. And some people are, ah, oh, yeah, I love God, but uh, there are other things that get my love and attention. And it's, I'm, I'm kind of half-hearted. Well, that's not good enough. <laughs> it's just not good enough as far as the Lord is concerned. Because the point that he's making here, we're to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and that language simply suggests a heart that is full of love. And so God expects us to love him with the same kind of love with which he loves us, a wholehearted. Let's also make this observation. Jesus went on much to their surprise maybe, or to the surprise of this lawyer, he said, I'm gonna tell you something else. <laughs> Not only is loving God the first and greatest commandment of all, I'll tell you what the second one is. It's, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said in verse 40, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now you may be thinking, oh my, I remember that saying, hang, and, and that is the way some translations translate that. On these two commandments, the whole law and the prophets hang. Well, that's another way of saying everything that God wants us to do about him and our responsibility in relationship to him depends upon loving him. Everything that God wants you to do in relationship to your neighbor, to your fellow man, has to do with loving your neighbor as yourself. And that's why the Lord said in verse 40, and we take it for face value, he said it, he meant it, it's true, 
on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Of course, he's talking about the Mosaical law and the Old Testament prophets here, but that's also true of the gospel of Christ. Every responsibility that you have to God depends upon your loving him with all of your heart. Everything that he and the Lord teaches you to do with your fellow man depends upon loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, there's a lot in that expression. And when we think about to the degree that the Lord expects us to love others, we start with, okay, how much do you love yourself? <laughs> it's this kind of innate, inherent love that God created in us, that certainly we care about ourselves. We're always going to act in our own best interest. We're always going to act for self-preservation if our mind, if we're thinking right. And so when we take that standard, then okay, how am I to act toward this guy? How am I to act toward this woman, this child, this relative? just like I would myself. And that gets back into the golden rule, doesn't it? But that's another subject. So leaving this, we simply say, having a heart for God clearly involves having a heart full of love for him. And it's possible that we could even wear the name Christian and that not be true. But we trust that we develop in that. We're going to continue to scan the Bible. This time we're going back to the Old Testament again. And something that David said in Psalm 119. This is in verse 48. He said, I shall lift up my hands to what? To you? Well, the way he said it in this verse, to your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on thy statutes so let's underline a point of emphasis. What is David saying about what he lifts up his hands to, pays honor to? I love. I love him. Now that just doesn't mean he thinks about them. <laughs> he has a feeling, a fond feeling for them. David says, thy commandments, I love. Now, that means the same thing as we just talked about a moment ago. So having a heart for God involves what? <coughs> having a heart that loves God's word. Now, that's different than loving God. You think, well, no, it's the same, isn't it? Well, it's closely related. Surely if you love God, you'll love his word, but some folks don't. So it's a separate thing that normally will, for a conscientious person who wants to do what's right and go to heaven, it'll, it'll work together but it's recognized differently in two separate independent things that are interrelated. That not only are we to love God, but as David said, we're to love what God said. God said it, if God said it, I love it. I have love for what God said. As a result, David had God's word where? <laughs> in his heart. We notice, you see, when you begin seeing these detail about these scriptures, David said in Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do thy will. I'm delighted, O oh my God. Thy law is within my heart. So David's heart for God involved loving his word and having his word in his heart. It's a heart that loves God's word and has God's word in his heart. Okay, let's take opportunity to look at the other side. What if a person doesn't? Is it serious? Can a person not love the word of God and get by and squeak into heaven? Right now. There's one passage in the New Testament that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica that explains this in few words. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. He said, and with all deception of wickedness for those who perish 
that is lost and will spend eternity in hell. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Now who is it that's going to perish? Those who don't love God's word. Those who don't hear it's the truth, the gospel of Christ for us and our salvation in Christ today. It's the New Testament, the law under which we live, the law of Christ. Because they did not receive the love. It didn't say receive the truth. They didn't love it. <laughs> well, how serious was that? They, per they will perish. And it made a difference a bit between being lost and saved. So having a heart for God involves a heart that loves the Bible, loves what God said. We just do. It's, it's not something that we feel indifferent about. It's not something that we grow tired of. It's something when you love something, like we're to love what God said, then we certainly have a heart that is for God. Well, we're going to scan to the Gospel of John. And another statement that the Lord made as he was talking to the woman at the well of Sychar. These are familiar statements, but it's going to be our closing point today. Because he was talking with this woman about where she was a Samaritan. <laughs> she was talking about how they worshipped in the Mount Gerizim. Jesus said to her, John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, The hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such doth the Father seek to be his worshipers. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. He said, is Jesus talking about having a heart for God? It's in there. <laughs> you may have figured it out already, but it's in there. Because of what he says you must do in order to worship God the way he expects you to. A heart for God is the heart of a true worshiper. Not everybody who worships God is a true worshiper. That's what the Lord is telling this woman. That's still true today. There are a lot of people supposedly worshiping God in thinking they're okay, but it's not true worship. It is false worship. Paul talked to the Colossians about will worship. That will worship is talking to them, the church at Colossae, about you folks have developed a lot of things that you do in service to God and worship to God that is from your own will. You have made these things up. You have produced a lot of things from your own volition. And brethren, that's will worship. And that will not be acceptable to God. So there are different kinds of worship that we read about in the New Testament that indicates to us there are wrong kinds of worship and there is true worship. So what kind of heart that we should have for God? Well, you want, I want, a heart of a true worshiper. This is a heart that Jesus explained in this passage, that worships God with the worship that he wants. He said, he told this woman, the hour cometh, and it's no longer going to be like it was under the Old Testament. But now is, and continues to be, and will continue to be. When true worshipers, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such does the Father seek to be his worshipers. So a true worshiper is one that worships God as he seeks. The, the, the worship that must be offered is, first of all, in spirit. There's the heart. It's called by a different word in the New Testament scriptures. If you worship in spirit, that means it's coming from your it's coming from what you mean. You're being sincere. You're being genuine. You're not just 
wording. You're not just expressing without giving thought. It's, it's real. It, it's from the heart. That's true worship. But true worship must also be in truth. And that is obvious, a, a worship that is assigned by God's word. Sometimes we have lessons on assigned or assumed. You can take everything in religion. It's either assigned or it's assumed. If it's assigned, A-S-S-I-G-N-E-D, like the word here, that means God taught it. He gave it. He assigned it to us. If it's assumed, it means, hey, I do what I want to do. I'm going to assume this is okay. Surely God will accept this. I, I know he will. It's not in the Bible, but I know God will accept this. No, you don't. God does not accept assumed worship. Worship that you and I can assume from our own heart. That's the kind that Paul condemned with the Colossians. So this makes it very clear. I'm, I'm looking for what the Bible teaches us on having a heart for God. And I'm learning that God wants us to have a heart that will make every effort to worship him as a true worshiper, one that worships from the heart, one that worships as he has assigned us. Well, we're back to where we started. And when we get the list before us, it's a, it's a rather interesting list. As I said at the beginning, I'm confident that other ways could be expressed. These could be expressed in other words. But when we scan the Bible and try to understand passages that are teaching us directly about how we're to have a heart for God, these are passages that you and I can hang our hat on because they teach what God taught us. Have a David-like heart. Study David, learn the kind of heart that he had, especially in his youth, in his pure innocence and devotion to God as God chose him to be the king of Israel. Even later as he sinned and repented, the heart of a child, the heart of a servant or a slave, a heart full of love for him, a heart that loves what he says, his word, the Bible, and a heart of a true worshiper. We trust that each of us can take that expression as I did that day I read this passage. It kind of changed my thinking about some things. I was ready to pass over that, said, I've got that, I've done that, been there, done that, you know, that kind of feeling. <laughs> Sometimes we can't do things that easily that the Bible teaches because if we're not careful, we fail to reach the depth of the treasures of God's Word. God's Word has treasures. And perhaps this is one of them that can teach us some things and give us a different perspective about our relationship to Him. Yes, I'm to give Him my heart. Yes, I'm to change my heart when, I, when it's called for in order to be like He wants me to be. But also, I need to have a heart that is for him. If you're here today and subject to the invitation of Christ, we urge you to think about that and perhaps avail yourself of the opportunity that we have during the singing of this song to respond to the invitation to become a Christian. We stand ready to assist anyone in any obedience to be baptized into Christ this very minute or to go to God in prayer for sin that you've committed this very minute, if that will help you in your relationship to him through your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us know while together we stand and sing.